Oh my god, they're everywhere. Invasive species are pushing native wildlife and industries to the brink. There is no predator. In 10 years from now, you do the map. It will be a catastrophic event, literally. And now, climate change is threatening to drive these invaders into backyards across America. At this size, it can definitely take your cat and dog. But some are fighting back. We can't have these things getting to the size that they get. Something has to be done. In the hopes they can restore balance before it's too late. Right here, right here. Wow. Nope. Gotta go out and get another one. around the other side and see if we can find it. Air on. That's funny. Air. Ready? Coastal Florida is home to the third largest reef system in the world. But it's being destroyed by an invasive species, the lionfish. A dangerous fish with venomous spines that must be caught at close range. Oh, we got one! <laughs> Barbara Draves and her sister Beth are recreational divers who've noticed a spike in the numbers of these fish. Come here, buddy. There he is. Anchors up, let's go. Let's go home. Lionfish are native to the South Pacific and Indian Ocean, where sharks, eels, and other predators keep their numbers in check. But in 1985, a lionfish was spotted off Florida's coast, possibly dumped from a personal aquarium. And now they ravage reefs from the Caribbean up to New York. Organizations have come up with a creative approach to fighting back. We did a total of seven dives, and we found lionfish on four out of the seven dives. Well, there you go. An annual lionfish derby, where cash and prizes are helping crowdsource a solution. There are seven teams that have been out since the crack of dawn. Three of them have come back, and this is the scoring station where uh, these women are, are just counting uh, how many lionfish have been brought back. It looks like at least 150 or so so far. The full extent of their impact is still unknown, but one recent study in the Bahamas reported a loss of 95% of native species because lionfish either ate or outcompeted other species for food. In second place, $250 cash, 382 millimeter lionfish team, Barbarella. Congratulations. Thank you. This was a good weekend for you. It was awesome. Last year we didn't do as well. There was a more team and like 500 more fish came in. Oh wow. Um, uh, the competition was, um, was just a lot more a lot more out there last mm. year. So Maybe this is having an impact. I think, I hope so. I, I hope it's having an impact. It's yeah. kind of why we do it. But the same site that we did last year, we did this year. There was 70 on it last year and there was two. Mm. Wow. Contests may be reducing populations in targeted areas, but the species likely has become too widespread to be eradicated. Foreign species aren't just threatening Florida's waters. They're also creating a crisis on land. And there's one invader so dangerous, only the elite hunt them. I try to catch at least one a week. That's, that's what my average is right now. Uh, I love the doubles and the triples. Sometimes I've caught two and, and three in a night, which is awesome. The other night I, I caught the two. Donna Khalil is the lone woman among dozens of hunters sanctioned by Florida to eradicate the Burmese python from the Everglades. We got a little one today. Oh, okay. Guess he's gonna be pretty much uh, at six. I don't know if we'll get any kinks out of him to make him any longer. Massage him a little bit. Ha, look at that, beautiful. The state pays Donna a bounty for every snake she brings in. 125. Dead or alive. 
Got to go out and get another one. The Burmese python is indigenous to Southeast Asia, but the exotic pet trade brought them to the U.S. Hurricane Andrew in 1992 exacerbated the problem as the snakes escaped from their damaged enclosures. Hello. Hey, hey, how's it going? Hold on, right, Renee, I've got, uh, let me, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you after I check in the snakes. I got a couple of snakes I gotta check in. All right, all right, bye. All right, just lining up another hunter. How oh, you well, doing? Sorry hi. about that. Adam. Adam, so hi, nice Adam, to meet Donna. You. Nice to meet you as well. Come on in. <laughs> the first one was uh, in 2015. I ran that one over. Actually, my husband ran it over. It's crossing the road right in the middle. We couldn't stop. It was going 55 miles an hour. Hmm. It turned around and started heading back to where it was going. After we hit it with the SUV with five people in it, okay? And as soon as I pulled it out, it's attacking me. It turned around and it started attacking me, uh, you know, trying to bite me, but I had my stick with me. So I'm holding it, you know, keeping the stick down and keeping it yeah. from biting me. And it's like, I'm doing this. It's like, holy, what? Where's the one that we ran over? I'm looking at the room, I'm looking at this. It's like, this is not the one we just ran over twice. You know, and it, as if nothing happened and it to was. it. it was, wow. So where are the snakes now? They're out in the garage right can now. Look? Yes, yes, we can. I, guess I, forgot how that I say this very nervously. Yeah. I've never been around pythons so, before. Keeping it in the bag is the safest thing. That's what you do. Yeah. As soon as you catch it, you put it in a bag. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then you box it up so that it uh, can't get out and strangle you as you're driving along. Yeah. What sort of a danger would this python pose if it was like out in the neighborhood? Pets, mostly at this stage, at this age, at this size, um, can definitely take your cat and dog. This size, eh, I don't think it's going to go after a person at this point. But I've come up, yet. Uh, yeah, I've come up against them that have, that you wow. know, that, that that can, you know. And there's not many things that a snake's going to think about. They're going to say predator or prey. Wow. Are can I eat you or are you going to eat me? Uh -huh. <laughs> and we can't have these things getting, you know, to the size that they get. Yeah, something has to be done. Burmese pythons are one of the largest snakes in the world, capable of swallowing a deer or a crocodile. They've even devoured human beings whole. Wow. Oh my God. You gotta understand, I love these animals. I love all animals, you know? Uh, when I look at this, it's like, how many of our native animals did this thing eat mm. to get that size? Yeah. And how many more will it eat if you left it out there? So the, the Everglades that you have come to know and love have changed forever because of this animal. Yeah, absolutely. In their native habitat, predators keep their population under control. In Florida's Everglades, there's hardly anything to stop them, except hunters like Donna. Right now, we're, we're um, bordering the east side of uh, Big Cypress National Preserve. Okay, so are you going to stay on the python perch? Yes. The one thing that you're doing up there, you're not just having a joy ride. You have to spot me a python. Okay. I, I don't think I'll be of much use, but sure. No. I'll, don't I'll keep an eye positive. out. So I actually have some responsibility tonight. I am the second pair of eyes looking out to the left. So hopefully we'll spot some python. But, okay, good? Good to go? Yes. All right. Since the snakes were introduced to the Everglades, a devastating 99% of most native mammals have been wiped out. Today, 13 endangered species are in the crosshairs of this predator. So again, the goal is to look just at the edge. Pretty much, yeah, just at the edge where the water comes to the land. Uh -huh. um, Sometimes they're in the water, mm. uh, hunting in the water, and sometimes they're coming up into the grass. All you need to see is just a few inches of it. And that's why a lot of the times you come across something like that, you don't see the whole snake. Uh -huh. So you don't know how big that thing is going to be when you pull it out. That's why I always go for the head. I want to know what I'm dealing with. I want to, I want to get that head under control before I pull anything out of there. So given the surroundings, I'm guessing what you're looking for is the dark patches in the pattern? Actually, more the light. Uh, the, the belly is, is, you know, white, and, and it comes up the side a little bit, and uh -huh. that's usually what catches my eye. 
There's no accurate count of Burmese pythons here today, but according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, nearly 100,000 pythons were introduced into the U.S. between 1996 and 2006. And one female can lay anywhere from 30 to 100 eggs each year. Wait, stop. And my 11 is periscoped. It's a small one. Is it? It's right here. Right, it's my, yep, my it 12. Is. And it is periscoping, that's pretty awesome. But that's a water snake. Ah. Let's see if I can get down there before he takes off. Wow. And there he goes. So, if that was a python, I would have jumped on him. <laughs> that was a but fast was moving a, snake. What's that? That was fast. Yeah. Um, he was just a banded water snake. He belongs out here. He's, mm. That's what we're protecting. So you want to see those? Yeah, I do. I do. I love seeing those little guys. At 734 square miles, the Everglades is two-thirds the size of Rhode Island. So finding these camouflage snakes is challenging. down there and search for them and hopefully they're someplace where we can see them. Donna searches well into the wee hours and in Louisiana another nightmare has emerged. Philippe Parola is a local like chef and yeah. businessman who took us out on an afternoon cruise. So welcome to Louisiana. <sighs> this is amazing. This is beautiful. Where are we now? We are on the old river, and on the other side is the Mississippi River. You have uh, the Mississippi, the Atchafalaya, the Red River, and the Old River, actually. Wow. Old rivers. A lot of fish. Yeah. The Mississippi is one of the largest waterways in the world home to 25% of North American fish species and an important fishing industry. Look! Oh, oh, oh. Look at how high Holy the Holy shit. These are Asian carp. They can reach 80 pounds, and when startled, will leap up to 10 feet out of the water. So what sort of a threat does this invasive pose to the natural ecosystem here? Well, it's a big threat, not, not only here, we're in Louisiana here, but they are all the way to Canada. They're in the entire Mississippi Basin. They multiply, they, they spawn like three million eggs per year. In some area, they got 70% ratio of survival on the eggs. Very, very productive. They eat plankton. Plankton is a food source of aquatic life. But why is it that this particular species is is able to propagate and sort of outcompete the native species? Because they reproduce so fast. There is no predator. The reproduction of these fish is phenomenal. Mm. So, and then, uh, uh, they, Oh shit. Oh, you got that on the camera? Holy shit. It's easy. Are you gonna neck out? You're gonna get knocked out. <laughs> you see this fish here? That's yeah. a small one. How, that, how, that, how? That's a 20 pound yeah, fish. This is, so this is a baby. This is a little that, one. This is a little one. That's a 20 wow. pound fish. That fish here will eat 15 pounds of plankton a day. In the 70s, these East Asian fish were imported to the U.S. to remove algae from ponds, but they were displaced by floods, and they now dominate the Mississippi River and its tributaries. Oh my God! Look! <laughs> I'm just not used to this yet. Look! 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 You're gonna get hit. You're gonna get hit. Oh shit! <laughs> I got whacked right in the chin. Yo, we're I getting bombarded there. there. <laughs> Sir, you got hit in the head? It's all set. I had like six in the boat at one time. We're laughing, but uh, one person driving that boat, like he said, 
you can get knocked out of that boat and conscious, you drown. That's, right. That's the bottom line. Right there where we were just at, I got hit in the face and it cut me under my eyebrow all the way across my eye. It I split hit, it, I like hit it split it open. Place. Richard Durrett is a local fisherman. Here, catfish, shrimp, and buffalo fish are staples. But they're increasingly becoming a rarity. This is what we catch. See, I was expecting, you know, oh yeah, well, little yeah. fish. Welcome to Louisiana. That's like hundreds of pounds you of the invasive hundreds. fish and uh, a 20, pounds. a 30 pounder oh, here. Yeah, yeah, it's more than 400 pounds. Wow. What do you do with these guys? Actually, we're supposed to throw them on the banks and kill them so they don't reproduce for next year. I've been on the river 35 years. The last 10 years has been my, struggle, my most struggling years. We need a market for these fish. If we could get a market for these fish, it would put our commercial industry back on the map. I mean, when I was a younger guy, we had probably 30, 32 local fishermen. We're down to seven now. Wow. Yes, sir. So this is not just an environmental issue. This is this is livelihood. This is this people's living. This is my only source of income is commercial fishing. But it's going to be to the point where there's no more seafood industry. It's, it's going to go away completely. And it's just a matter of time. This fish needs to go away. Simple as that. Some kind of way, he needs huh. to go away. And we hadn't figured it out yet. Attempts to contain the Asian carp have been underway for over a decade, including an underwater electric barrier built to keep them from entering the Great Lakes, where a $7 billion fishing industry is at risk. But the vast majority of efforts along the Mississippi have failed. So what would happen if, if unabated, if, if you just let the carp reproduce as is, yes. what would happen to this ecosystem? Well, you saw how many fish we could see out there. In 10 years from now, you do the math. You won't be any more coo and bath and brame and catfish. The vegetation you see there will probably die. The birds won't be able to feed. I mean, it, it will be a catastrophic event, literally. And the cost of that for future generation that's going to face this reality, mm -hmm. Because in action to what we do here today, it would be terrible, terrible. Back in Florida, the python continues to elude us on our third late night with Donna. Okay, I'm gonna hold the head because he is nasty. He's not happy. So I'll keep I'll keep a hold of his head so he doesn't bite you. Ow. Wow, that is freakish. Holy shit. Okay, now let's let him wrap around your arm once. <laughs> I'll just wrap him around you just to feel the, the strength of this. Wow. He was just out here having a good old time, looking for some food. Okay, now Donna, have I pissed you off now? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Nope. nope. You're safe. Now this is a Burmese like python, me, yeah. Medium size. This is actually this guy is probably only about two years old. Two years old and he's this big. Yeah. So there's really not that much that's going to eat him. There's no birds, um, no raccoons, nothing, uh, nothing to, to predate on him except uh, alligators. At this stage, two years old. The strength of this is incredible. Another year and he'll be able to breed. And first year or so, he'll probably have 15 to 25 eggs. 
and you know when they get to be 18 feet they can have over a hundred eggs in them so they're just breeding like you know breeding like crazy wow. and there you have it oh my God. the florida burmese python do you think the burmese python can be stopped stopped from progressing north i hope so that's what we're trying to do ha huh, okay ready go for the grab oh, oh shit. <laughs> Oh my god. He isn't happy anymore. He's not happy anymore. You're gonna continue to yes, you see he's coiled. He's coiled, he's going for my face. He's going for my face. So I went for your face first. So there. As their food supply in the Everglades dwindles, these snakes are on the move. And experts say climate change is further expanding the python's habitat. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Great. So on to the next one. But Donna insists humans, too, can bite back. Gracie's doing the ceviche, the lionfish. These are from Whole Food. We usually get our own. We've been moving around so much, we haven't been out uh, spearfishing lately. So the python has been um, stewing in this mango base with garlic, ginger, and turmeric. Come on, Gracie. I will not. There is no way. <laughs> One little bite. Tiny. Come on, tiny. Even a tiny little itty bitty bite. No, no, no. Tastes like mango. Chicken and mango. The iguana and the, um, the lionfish. All three of these are invasive species. Two out of the three we can eat on a daily basis. Come on, come have a seat. This is very exciting. Is this, do you plan meals around invasive species? Um, we haven't, this is the second time we've had iguana, I think. Lionfish, all the time. Uh -huh. It's an invasive, so you're helping out if you're uh -huh. eating these things. So this is quinoa, corn, celery, and Burmese python. Mm -hmm. Yep. Not my favorite meat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But it's funny, it's all about perception, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you suspend your imagination for a second and don't look at, you know, uh, the, <laughs> the snake, snake okay. itself. So there's a little bit of marketing and branding that goes a long way. Exactly, think, right? exactly. Mm. friend after seeing the fish been hitting you in the face and jumping in the boat and telling how bad it's they are my revenge well, now I get your to revenge it. Philippe thinks business may be the only solution so he's trying to turn Asian carp into a culinary staple it tastes like a cross between like a white fish and almost like a crab or something yes it's funny when you when you were talking about invasive species and invasive fish I don't know what I was expecting in my head, but it wasn't expecting it to taste good. But this is actually very, very good. Oh, thank you. According to Philippe, the hardest part of selling Asian carp to the masses isn't the taste. It's their complex bone structure that makes preparing them a tedious task. Now you tried this out and you told me, isn't it incredible, Phil? Oh, it's good. It's clean, no fishy taste. There is nothing bad about it. The only part of me is it's all those bones. Mm. So, so this, the bone is one of the impediments to making this a, a, oh, yeah, a more yeah, of a mainstream... I, yes, yes. I mean, you know, it, it's just a big, big issue. Mm. Uh, the second issue is that it's classified as invasive. So mentally, a lot of people will not adventure themselves. It doesn't into sound trying, very appetizing. Into trying to, to do mm -hmm. something like this with those fish. Oh. And then I look at it and say, wow, hold on a minute. If the only problem, you know, is about both bones and the name, then let's change the name and let's remove the bones, right? If the goal here is to try to reestablish the natural order, why is eating these species the solution as opposed to, say, trying to eradicate them through other means? Well, eradication is a big word. What my solution provides, so, versus eradication, is that you're gonna have many more jobs 
You talk to fishermen this morning, they're starving to death. We're going to be able to create thousands of jobs throughout the entire Mississippi Basin with this fish alone. It's an economic impact, too, which is much needed. Are there any past examples of successes in getting a population to, to, uh, to take on invasive species and, and, and to incorporate that into their, into their diets? No, not to the, to the extent that the we, we want to achieve here. This is the very first. Mm. But if you can come up with a product that they can easily prepare and eat, then you are in the market. Mm. It, it's a good eating fish, there is no doubt. Mm. Once an invasive species gains a foothold in an ecosystem, it's there to stay, often with devastating consequences. Nearly 40% of all species that have gone extinct in the last 400 years disappeared largely because of invasives. As climate change increases habitable ranges, invasives are likely to find even more territory to intrude and destroy, with little to stop them. <laughs>